Let's go on vacation. But by the way, we're gonna go to some of the poorest places on the planet and we're gonna do humanitarian work while you're there. But it's really, really fun. So says today's guest, Gina Gadat. Gina, welcome. Thank you for having me. Is that right? Is it really, really fun to go to these places? You know, it really is fun. It's very rewarding work for me. I think some of the things I've done have been shocking at first to people, but once they get their hands wet and they get in the trenches, they really love it. Now you call it a, a term. Volun how do you say that? Voluntourism? Voluntourism is what we've coined. And that's actually sort of the third tier of what I do when I'm working with humanitarian work. So that's in the trenches. And what we've oh. done actually is take travelers who are already on vacation anyway, and they're going to go zip lining and swim with the dolphins and have a good time with their family, and ask them that they would take one day out of their trip and actually give back to that country by going and working in a project. And that could be anything from a shelter to an orphanage. Um, to a community center. So that is uh, getting their hands wet. Now the other tiers that I work on are um, a little bit more complicated but just as important. Well we're going to be talking about oh, oh, your international humanitarian work overall but um, this sounds like a a travel gig. You're, you're not a travel agent though, are you? I am not a travel agent, no. I have just collaborated with various travel companies or groups of people that are already organized and then I just kind of come on board and it's up to them if they want to come or not. We've had a lot of situations where they didn't know what I was talking about in the lobby on the first day, but by the time the word got out by day five, I had a couple Greyhound buses ready to go out with me. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, and, and I don't want to belittle this at all. In fact, it's actually, I'm, I'm uh, really ad admiring you. But when I say this question, you're like just a regular person who decided to do something right. Just a regular person. My background is twofold in a fitness, a fitness background, and then as a psychologist, so licensed mental health. So what I've been able to do is really blend the two together, the health and fitness, and use physical and emotional health to kind of serve the people and meet the needs there. Wow. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about you, though. I mean, you're, um, why, what is it that got this, this bug to go around the world doing things like this? Yeah, it's an interesting sort of, it's not actually what I intended to do. Um, I started out in the fitness field and had a personal training studio, and I noticed, and I was working with women, I'd hear over and over their life story, and I thought, wow, I better go back and get more schooling. I better get, you know, a master's in psychology so I can actually do some justice here <laughs> and, and know what I'm talking about. So. Um, I added that degree and in doing that also a foundation for teenage girls. I have three daughters myself and I saw that their self-image and their esteem needed bolstering so I created a fit girl conference and in doing that I got quite a bit of attention just helping them with boundaries with boys and how to fight fair with mom and eating disorders and then how can they give back what their purpose is and so those opened additional doors for me in international work and domestic violence and human trafficking of girls so that's really what I focused on now is sort of that last step of what are the needs of young women um, and teenage girls internationally in that area. Wow, I've just worn out so far. I mean, my gosh, <laughs> when, do you, when do you have time to sleep? Oh, I love what I do, though. <laughs> well, actually, we've got, we've got countries to talk about. Nepal, Mexico, Hungary, Kenya, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia. I'm yeah. worn out with that, too. <laughs> but you know what? Let's go to Nepal. Okay. What was the circumstance that you went to Nepal? I was asked to go to Nepal several years ago and I hired a shelter director here in Seattle mm -hmm. and her name was Leela and she told me her story about being trafficked herself in Nepal and she was in America to raise money to buy a parcel so that she could build a shelter and help children like herself. And lo and behold, she did that. She raised the money, she bought the property, she built a shelter and so she wanted me to come and train the staff. So finally, five years later, I took a trip to Nepal. A lot of other doors opened when I was there, but I went straight away to her shelter and I was so impressed by what she put together. And this particular facility is filled with kids that have been trafficked into the sex trade, but also kids that were sold to the circus. So if you think about Nepal, you have China, it's sandwiched between China and India. Mm -hmm. Well, these kids, the poverty in their family, they sold them out into India into the circus thinking that they would have a life better than they have at home, but inevitably these kids were kept in cages and just had heartbreaking stories to tell me. But they had escaped or been rescued and were in the shelter, so my job really was to help the staff, none of which except for one had any background in how to deal with post-traumatic stress syndrome or any of the trauma the kids had gone through. So we did a several day training on how to work with these kids and was able to raise the money to support one full-time staff. Um, $2,000 pays for one year's salary. 
for this counselor. So there's a full-time uh, person there now that does what I can do and, you know, be supporters of the other staff, which is really exciting. So that was a huge project in Nepal, but there was many others as well. No, yeah, but there is so much in just you, what you just said. I, I've got to ask about this. You, you, were, you were there fighting sex trafficking or actually helping someone recover and recover others. Um, how did how did kids get in that in the first place in Nepal, separate and apart from here in the United States? Mm -hmm. um, it comes down to poverty, Stan, really, really does. And so when the families can't feed another child, they're turned out on the street or they're sold. Now, the ones in this shelter were fortunate enough to get away, to run away, to escape the circus or escape their trafficker. Um, many of them aren't. I met a lot of kids that were on the street. The street kids I spent a day going down mm -hmm. Kathmandu. And I was like the Pied Piper, you know, they just kind of came following. Here's the blonde woman, obviously looked different than everyone. And I heard their story. I gathered them together, gave them a hot meal. And many of those kids, one little girl, nine years old, had been there since she was three. And she said that her parents sent her actually from India into Nepal, thinking that if she could gather garbage on the street, she could recycle some of those bottles and at least be able to eat with some pennies um, that she could gather, which she had been doing for many years with her little brother. And... Um, <laughs> My mission there actually was to clean them up because there's no clean water in Nepal and these kids had been two, three years without a bath. So I went and I literally bought out this one merchant of soap and toothbrushes and toothpaste. I think it was two cents for a bar of soap and gave all the kids some things to clean up with. We found a place for them to bathe and they were giddy and they were thrilled and um, it was a really, it was a great time with them. But leaving it like that isn't enough for me because really want things to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I just can't uh, leave something with just, you know, a one one shot over. And so I met a guy who was actually had a, he had a passion for the street kids. And I talked to him for a while. And what he agreed to do was to take each of these kids and mentor them underneath a different merchant in the town so that they could learn like an apprentice what that trade was in exchange for one free meal. So these kids could actually get food and learn something and, and contribute to the society when they got older. So you're a negotiator too. I try, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I try to find a solution. You did all this on your own money? Yeah, I raise money sometimes on Facebook. People give me <laughs> things and, um, you know, I'm in my own practice, so I take six, eight weeks off of my practice just to volunteer and do this. But people have been super generous to donate money for baby formula, um, for sewing machines that I use in some countries, and, and the rest. Does Mother Teresa communicate <laughs> with you from heaven? Is that what it is? Oh. I'm I don't think so. I'm not that good. Um, are there other people that help you in this now? You know, I have had a team of people, but they haven't been organized. So when I go on a trip, I will look for other experts or people that want to come on board. Like I said, with volunteerism, you don't need to know anything. Just have a willing heart, be able to hold a baby. The next level that I work at, the next tier level, is really training the staff, the counselors, the leadership that are giving direct resources to the mm -hmm. victims. And I love having other counselors come with me and other therapists. And then, of course, the top level that I always hope for is can I get into the government? Can I work with the legislature, the leaders, the decision makers, because inevitably they're the people that can make a difference long term. Yeah, but they're also the people who help make it happen and, and get so bad in the first place. I know there's a lot of corruption and I've seen it. Um, we can talk about that more in Africa. <laughs> well, I say let's not go to Africa right now. Let's go uh, around the world to Mexico. Okay. Uh, because you've got some very fun things in Mexico um, around a dump. Yes. There are people living in the dumps all over. Uh, Mexico and all over the world actually and I was asked to go there for a couple reasons the violence of course in the home um, and also the children who are living up on the dump within the glass and the garbage mm -hmm. I met a woman who gave up everything her and her husband in Canada and they went to Mexico into Puerto Vallarta and their mission was how can we get these little kids safe so they successfully got the children from crawling around in the dump so the parents could work recycling and gathering garbage that they could sell. A good day would be 5 to $10 that they could make on the amount of things mm -hmm. that they could recycle. But the kids were taken down into a child care center, but they didn't know what to do with them as far as counseling and how to sort of rehabilitate them from the life they had been raised in. Mm -hmm. So I came and I did a bunch of training for the counselors there and then worked with the mothers because domestic violence is huge. Um, and actual sexual assault. Three out of four girls are sexually assaulted before the age of 12. 
in Latin America. Oh so gosh. I went and bought some books from Amazon and I had them translated, little storybooks, into Spanish and I gave them to the workers there so that every week they could read stories to the children that could help them to know about proper touching and what wouldn't be proper. So a lot but of work to be done there. But you're fighting a culture there, aren't you? Fighting a culture, but the people left there, um, like this woman that had given up her entire life and her staff, are committed. So having the resources they didn't have before also interpreted in, uh, an entire Bible study into uh, an applicable uh, book club type mm -hmm. study on domestic violence and how to work with your husband and how to create peace. They can't, of course, leave their husbands or their families all the time, but there's ways that they can learn to support each other as women and have a voice. Mm -hmm. So leaving those type of studies there have been um, implemented quarter after quarter, and I hear that it's been successful. So it makes it warms my heart. <laughs> so Mexico actually turned into that volunteerism. Oh yes, right. And so the first day I'd gone to the dump, and I think I took five people with me from the five star resort. But they came back to the resort and reported in to everybody. And so as people were jumping around in the pool having their drinks. Um, it was being spread. What is this Gina lady doing? Yeah, but before you go on, I mean, what do you do? Do you go in the lobby and just say, hey, you know, we're going to go have a good time over here at the dump. Come with me. <laughs> is that what you do? I go to the pool side and I say, hey, here's the deal. You know, I know you guys are all on vacation, but if you are interested in doing some charity work, w meet me at 8 a.m. in the lobby. And the, there's a few daredevils. But what <laughs> happens is the second day, it grows and it grows. Uh -huh. So then taking to the orphanages and the ladies that love to hold the babies and the grandmas mm -hmm. that like to feed them, and then the next day and the next day. So in this particular trip, by day five, we had two Greyhound buses that we had to arrange to be there with, I think, 83 people. Wow. And we went to a community center, and they built an entire playground for the children oh, on fantastic. their own dime. They put in the, the landscaping and everything. So, How many languages do you speak? Just English. Just English. I always have to have a translator. I wish I could speak every language. It's... There was a story, though, about uh, an interesting occurrence in Mexico surrounding the dump that I think a group of people... Um, didn't get what they thought they were going to get. <laughs> oh, right. So because people in these resorts are vacationing from all over the world and various mm -hmm. countries, there was a group of people, I'm thinking they're Japanese actually, and they had got word of it that I was going to go and do some various things. They thought it was excursions because mm -hmm. you know how these resorts put together all of these mm -hmm. uh, adventure excursions. So we were almost out the door. Um, we were on into the, the van pool and they had misinterpreted that it wasn't, um, they thought they were going to swim with the dolphins, <laughs> not to work in the dump. And of course, as soon as they heard garbage and dump, they, they didn't want to sign up for it. So I had to start all over again and, and go recruiting a new group. Well, but just about everybody else, though, well, they, they found out, hey, we're going to a dump. We're going to go to go clean this up. What's the yeah. reaction of the people? I mean, Tears. Tears, and they get there and they can't believe what they're seeing because it's like less than half of a mile from a beautiful paradise. And I say, you know, it's it's paradise to poverty and back for them. But you know, I get emails and I just it makes me cry to think about it. But I hear that was the best part of my vacation. Really? Thank you for showing up. So, do you think you're a uh, travel agent now? No, I'm not a travel agent. <laughs> <laughs> Is somebody? I mean, do you just like show up and? and then find the bad parts and say, let's go fix this? I try and wait for invites. I don't lay my ideas over a project. I wait till I get an invite and usually what they want and I get a need list from them. And then I say, do you, are there volunteers that can help in certain areas and what can I do for you? What can I do to care for the caregiver? Mm -hmm. Does your staff need anything? Um, there's a lot of corruption, so I'm very careful. And I have a colleague that actually, he checks into a lot of things for us. And uh, are the orphanages corrupt? Are they spending their money wisely? And I always tell people, please don't give money. You know, if they want something like formula, we go in, we roll in, we take, you know, their donations, we go to the local Costco or the Walmart, we buy the formula, we walk it in there, and we put it on the shelf. Wow. Let's go to a different part of the world. Let's go to Hungary. Did, uh, did you were invited there to Eastern Europe? Right. Um, the Fit Girl Tour that I mentioned that I had done and my nonprofit initially, mm -hmm. um, someone got word of it in Hungary, and that was the first exposure I had to trafficking shelters. 
I didn't know what was going on. I'd heard about it, but I'd never mm -hmm. been in the thick of it. And in Hungary, they have set, um, created actually, these group homes that are a bit like sorority houses. I think it's a great model. Mm -hmm. So when they rescue the girls from the trafficking, they get to be in homes of 8 to 12 with a house mom. And they get to learn life all over again because they've been on the street since they were little girls. So they brought me into these shelters, these safe houses for these girls, and I spent a week going over personal safety, self-defense. I don't know if you know, I'm a kickboxing instructor. <laughs> so a in lot, your spare time. Yeah, yeah, in my spare time. And so I love to teach fitness. So we did a lot of body awareness because girls that have been in the sex trade have a real disconnect with their bodies. They've disassociated for good reason, mm -hmm. for survival. So we do a lot of yoga and meditation and self-defense and also planning their future. What kind of skills do they have? What kind of um, career would they like to see? Mm -hmm. And then we created another kind of a, um, apprenticeship where these girls could work in a bakery or a pasta shop or learn to cut hair. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was my first exposure, actually, to the mm -hmm. trafficking shelters. Rescuing children from trafficking, mm -hmm. um, particularly in a, a country, well, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, how does that happen? Well, it happens because people aren't afraid to get involved when they see something suspicious. Is it Americans, is it Westerners, or is it people right there at home that do it? It's hopefully people in the community is what we want to recognize what's going on, and mm -hmm. instead of turning and their eye to away from it and thinking that it's not none of their business, it's to get involved and to report to the authorities. There are many, many good organizations now that are trying to go in and to rescue girls, but you have to be careful. You can't just come in off the street. People tell me, oh, can I just come with you and save some kids? And I'm like, if you want to get killed, because I've been arrested and handcuffed and detained in many places myself. And so looking like a tourist and a traveler is key, and some people can come in and um, you know jeopardize their own safety, so we have to be careful. You've been arrested and handcuffed? I have, in Cambodia. <laughs> oh, Cambodia. Well, we were going to go to Kenya next, but let's go to Cambodia. <laughs> Tell us about that. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, in Cambodia, right in Phnom Penh, on the Mekong River, there is a place called the Heart of Darkness. And I was asked to go, and um, there's, a, there's a trafficking shelter there, and several organizations that are working to rescue girls from the Heart of Darkness. Now, this area is um, uh, a lot of underage girls. There's something called sex tourism, and sex tourism is when uh, men sign up It'd be like signing up for a vacation on Expedia for mm -hmm. going from country to country and getting with virgin girls or young girls. God. It's it's really sickening. Yeah. And there's a big, a lot of that going on in Cambodia. And there was a gentleman that I wanted to meet with there that had many famous restaurants in France. And he sold them all and took all the money and went into Cambodia and came into the heart of darkness and went into the brothels and into the bars. And he talked to men um, from Germany and America and said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? These could be your daughters and tried to basically talk some sense into them and then ask the girls, do you want to get out of this lifestyle? And then when they would want to do it, he would employ them in a restaurant that he started making restaurants in Cambodia. What he wanted me to do was to work in the shelters to try to de-traumatize them so that they actually could learn a new profession, a new job. So in doing that, somewhere along the line, it was complicated, but I think I took a picture of the U.S. Embassy and I was handcuffed immediately oh. <laughs> <laughs> to answer okay. your question. So after they took my phone and my passport and my camera, I um, was able to talk them into the fact that I was just a tourist. So, But, but you really weren't just a tourist. You were there doing humanitarian work. Right. So, so i got to ask this question then. Um, what do you do? What do you talk about with a young girl in Cambodia who has grown up if you will, if she is grown up, grown mm -hmm. up in the sex trade. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shame and guilt. And I think one thing that I have going for me is I'm not going to spread any rumors to the community because I'm not from there. And I don't know the people that they know. Once they've been sold, either by a family member or they've been captured, and once they're in the sex trade, there's no going back to their family. There's so much shame involved in that. And, and there's not... Shame oh, that they went back? Um, or shame that they were in it. They're in it. Oh. Even if their but parents they were the one, it? many times. But you can't come back. And so the scary part for them is, what next? What do I do? What can I do? So and if you're a parent and you sell your child into the sex trade, you have just given them away. Right. Many times, though, they're tricked into thinking they're going to get a better life and they're actually sold as a nanny or maybe a housekeeper. But most often that's a lie. 
most mm -hmm. often that's a lie. So when to answer your question, in working with the girls, a lot of it is just letting them tell their story of shame. And, they, and they've and they never felt or heard it until they hear themselves. You know how they say we don't believe it till we hear ourselves say it. Mm -hmm. In saying it, I'm able to let them know that they matter and they're lovable and they're not broken and that there's a chance for them and there's a plan and that we can help them if, if they're interested in that. How can you identify with them? I mean, you're blonde, they're not. Mm -hmm. You're white, they're not. Yeah. You speak English, they don't. Right. Um, well, I have um, very personal reasons for being involved in this. I think the audience of the children and the teenage girls, I connect with them. I'm adopted myself. My parents gave me up. Um, they were poor. They had no way to take care of me. And uh, so when I see these kids that were given up or the little children in the orphanage, I have a deep connection with them. It's like an intrinsic motivation that I have. And same with teenagers and the child bride. I was married at 18. And so in, in essence, I was a child bride in America. Mm -hmm. And I have three daughters. So for me to want them, all women, to have a life and an education and for them to have purpose and meaning, is it's it's raw for me. It means a lot. Matter of fact, when I'm not doing this, I'm anxious. And when I'm doing it and I'm involved, I feel that fulfillment, that reward. Um, do you go back to places where you've been? I do. I've been back to the dump and all the orphanages and disabled centers in Mexico many, many times over. The kids know me. I know their names. We play jump rope and uh, do puppet shows. And it's Yes, I do go back. And I Skype with the directors and the leadership. How's that curriculum going that I left with you for the Women's Domestic Violence Book Club? How are the children responding to the books that we left about um, sexual abuse and touching? And is, are the, is the counseling working? Are the mm. kids able to sleep? Are they still having nightmares? And how many of the girls in Hungary are now working? That they're now working in the bake shop. How many have their own businesses? And I love, I love Skype because <laughs> you can see the directors and know what's going on. Hmm. Let's head south from Hungary. Let's go to Kenya. Was that fun? Kenya was fun. I was not near the Ebola. Everyone kept saying, oh, worried about that, but I was definitely in the violence. Hmm. So um, Kenya was huge because, like I mentioned before, the top tier, three tiers for me to think about in every trip that I do, um, the on-the-ground people in the trenches, the working with the leadership, but the top is the government. And that was a situation that I had been contacted by the only female attorney at the time in Nairobi that wanted to start a law to protect women and children, a domestic violence law. And she wanted me to bring Washington State's legislature, because we do have the gold standard for domestic violence and other states have used our, our legislation. And she wanted me to come and address the parliament. And I'm not, I'm not an attorney. And I don't know how to write that type of verbiage, but I was invited in to um, address both the public prosecutor's office and the Women's Caucus and the members of parliament mm -hmm. and talk to them about domestic violence in their country and what we could do. What I learned, and I always learn something, more than something, is that it wasn't so much the law they needed, it was what the solution was in the sentence. So we can tell the women in the country, now you have protection, there's a law, your husband can't beat you. But as soon as she says, my husband beat me, and they turn him in and throw him in jail, there goes the guy that's providing for the family. And then the kids don't have food after that. So she goes back and says, I lied, I just fell down the stairs and broke my arm. Let him out, I need him to work for our family. So I spent most of my time on those days working with um, the parliament members explaining to them the 52-week batters treatment program that we have and other states have picked up, which actually help men. It's, it's a weekly meeting, almost like AA, but it mm -hmm. teaches them how to communicate better and in a nonviolent way with their children and with their wives. So in doing that, they can still work and be at home, and then the women get an advocate so they can report in if he's really doing it, if he's changed. Wow, that's a big change that because there are cultures there, mm -hmm. uh, the Maasai being one. I met with the Maasai. Who are very violent to women. Right. A Maasai leader came down to talk to me. He had 52 wives. I asked him, are you nice to your wives? And he started to cry. He said, we need to be better. 52 wives? Yeah. So I want to go back, and he says that he'll implement into the, the Maasai tribe some of these principles of how to communicate That's in a nonviolent way. That's a huge change, though. That's a huge cultural change. Right, and it's going to take a while. I, I, don't, I don't believe that it's going to be overnight, but they were receptive. 
they were really receptive. There. Were you there by yourself or were you there with a group? Um, loosely knit group. There were some people doing a dental clinic in the slum and there were other people working in a medical field. So I was interested in working um, in the slums and with the orphan mm -hmm. kids, also with the street kids and their sewing program there because we need the women to have a way that they can provide for their families financially and in many countries including Nepal what I found is if they can learn on those trundle sewing machines that don't take electricity how to make clothes for their community then they can support themselves mm -hmm. so I brought in a lot of fabric and I brought in donations and I bought a lot of sewing machines and we got them distributed in Africa to the sewing school so the girls could actually start their trade when they got out of the school so as we continue in your vacations around the world <laughs> uh, Kyr Kyrgyzstan, is that how you say that? Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, mm -hmm. tell us about that. That's a completely different area than what we've been. Kyrgyzstan was having a women's conference with all the stands, as they call it. So mm -hmm. Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, very dangerous area. And women were coming together because they wanted to have a think tank about how to protect the women in their countries and what they could do to empower each other as a group. So um, some told me, me right out that they were at the conference and that they might not get home safe. Um, that if they brought too much information that would rock the boat, that they would have to be careful. So I spoke at this event and what I found out is that bride napping um, was one of their biggest problems. Bride napping? Bride napping. So not too much different than what we saw happen in Nigeria. Uh, in the middle of the night, groups of men, young men, come into a village and take dozen or so girls age 12 or so back many many days walk you know to a different village that probably has a different dialect to take them as wives which is so traumatizing to the girls yeah. and they'll pluck them off playgrounds but most time it's at night and the women have had it and the grandmas were saying I'm ready to go back and rescue my daughters and my granddaughters how are we going to change this culturally the child bride program so we worked a lot on that and then I did again a lot of counseling and helping them to um, basically not burn out because these people that are in leadership roles that are trying to change their countries they get compassion fatigue yeah yeah so I can understand that. <laughs> we only have about a minute left um, India and Nicaragua are on tap for 2015 yes Right, again, working with the programs there that are already underway, trying to give them more resources and support their leadership. Um, for sure, India, biggest red light district in Kolkata. I will be staying there for two weeks, um, right on the street with the girls, helping to train the staff on how to prevent them from going back into the industry, which is what they're familiar with, uh, and to try to rehabilitate them. So it'll, it'll be a big job. I'm excited. I want to do more. Nicaragua? Uh, relief efforts. I've been to the 9-11 site and the Katrina site when that mm -hmm. happened. There have a lot of earthquakes. I just had one in November, 7.3. So a lot of children are left without parents at that point. A lot of damage gets done. There's a lot of broken families and disaster. So again, counseling and training counselors and PTSD. These are vacations? Well, I call it that for me. <laughs> Sometimes I'm sleeping on the ground on a dirt floor and there's no clean water and I'm living on power bars, <laughs> but it's so rewarding. You know what? I think that there is going to be a time where you're going to be back on our show. I hope I so. I sure hope so. With that, however, we have to close. That's been Gina Gadat, Volunteerism, and more. Take care.